Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 11th hour streaming live on upstart.net.au. I am Adam Ionidas, and this is James Hurley. Say hi to the camera, James. Hello. Great man, great man. We have a jam-packed show for you today, but it's also our last show for the semester because we'll be going on a two-month break, which is much needed. We have a lot of stuff coming up, so when, you, when you come, bring it through it, James. We have our series regular Finley Pollock coming in shortly to give us some health, t- health tips specifically concerning things you st- should stay away from in the exam period, which is coming up with a lot of students. Jess Whitby are coming for a live chat talking, us, talking to us about current housing affordability. Christian Santanelli and a few other team members had a look at stress less week last week, so I have a little sneak peek what that was all about. Christian will also be showing her life hacks this week. We'll also be had it having the head of Upstart Live, Phil Kafkalides, on a talk about his experience in the media industry and as well as showcasing the montage for the final week of La Trobe. And lastly, we'll always have a sports wrap-up with the show with our dynamic gurus, Braden May and Ryan Rosendale. That is some great stuff, James. I'm excited. Are you excited? I'm excited. That's great. How's your week? Yeah, it was pretty good. Just jam-packed with assignments. And what about yourself? Yeah, no assignments. No oh, assignments. I envy you, mate. Oh. Thank you. I did. I actually ignored them, though. <laughs> but first... Let's take a look at the headlines with Lisa Berg. Thanks, guys. An explosion in Manchester has left 19 confirmed dead and almost 50 injured. According to police, the incident took place outside of Manchester Arena at the end of an Ariana Grande concert. Police have said they are treating it as a terrorist incident until they know otherwise. Witnesses report hearing loud bangs at the end of the concert, followed by smoke. After leaving the venue, there were lines of police vans and ambulances. Manchester police are carrying out a controlled explosion as a second bomb has been found. The Daily Mail, the Daily Mail has reported that some parents have turned to social media to try to contact their children who were at the concert, including one girl as young as six. More information has yet to be released. Police are investigating a potential signal fault after the tram collision in Melbourne's inner north on Monday. A truck carrying soil and the tram collided on Elliott Avenue in Parkville around 8 a.m., causing dozens of injuries and 14 people being taken to hospital. The impact forced the tram off its tracks and tipped the truck, causing it to leak fuel. Police are looking into witness accounts that say both vehicles had a green light. Yarra Trams has said Route 58 trams automatically trigger a green light at that intersection. Australian mining magnate has, magnate has donated $400 million to charity. Andrew Twiggy Forrest announced Monday that he would be donating $400 million of his money to various organizations. $75 million will go to cancer research, $75 to higher education, $75 to childhood education, $75 to eliminate modern poverty, and $50 million to Indigenous advantage. The announcement was made at Parliament House in Canberra alongside Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and Opposition Leader Bill Shorten. This is the largest philanthropic donation by a living person in Australian history. A South African big game hunter has been killed following a hunt that went wrong. 51-year-old Theonis Botha accidentally led a group of hunters into a breeding herd of elephants, causing a charging frenzy. A female elephant picked Botha up by her trunk. The elephant was then shot by another hunter and she fell on top of Botha. He leaves a big game hunting empire that includes private shooting ranches in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Mozambique, and Namibia. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Lisa. So the Ariana Grande thing, that's pretty, that's a yes. pretty massive thing. That is massive. Yeah, there's updates coming pretty regularly as well as the, the events unfold, so... That's right. So we'll probably hear more about that later in the show. Definitely. 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 Um, Botha, big game hunter. That's ironic. It's very ironic. There's some serious irony in there. It is ironic, yes. Shouldn't have been there in the first place. So uh, he's left a giant game hunting empire. That's 
That's not a not a phrase I thought I'd ever hear. I'm gonna be honest. Game hunting empire. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> that's some stuff. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. You can also follow us at eleventh uh, hour underscore LTU on Twitter for all the exciting conversations. <laughs> now we'll be having uh, a live guest, Finn Pollock. Will be coming into the studio to talk of us talk to us about cigarettes, alcohol, and what not to do during exam week. Hey, Finn. Hello, guys. How are you? Good. Yeah, good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. That's good. You got some stuff for us today? Yeah, I definitely do. So we're going to be talking about drugs and alcohol and how they influence um, nutrition in the body. Awesome. So, <laughs> you want to tell us some more about that? Uh, yeah. Obviously, drugs and alcohol are, you know, bad mm. for us. So... What Why specific exactly type of alcohol bad? is like, worse for you? Like, is it beer, wine, spirits? What's the worst impact on your mind or even your body? Yeah, studying? definitely. So I think what we need to know is what is a standard drink firstly. So that's 10 grams of pure alcohol. Mm. And what we know is that alcohol percentage, it does vary from drink to drink. Mm. And so when you are looking at how much a standard drink is, you want to flip over to the back of the label to see how much is actually on it. Yeah. Mm. Is it true if you have a glass of wine a day, it's healthy? Or is that a lot of rubbish? Yeah, look, I think with wine, they suggest that red wine is actually better for you because it's rich in antioxidants. So mm-hmm. we, what we know is polyphenols. So they're actually better for you. However, we do know that alcohol, it is quite high in kilojoules compared to um, macromolecules like your proteins and your fats. Mm. So wine is not healthy per se, but... It's the better alternative. However, what you want to be doing is drinking in moderation and spreading out your intake throughout the, your um, day or night. Um, so what I would be suggesting is limiting your intake to two standard drinks a day. So what you want to be doing is um, just having two, spreading them out and having maybe one or two um, for drinking free days throughout the week. Okay. All right. Do you drink regularly? <laughs> No, I tend to not, actually. I prefer not to drink, especially throughout the university semester. I find that it can really um, decrease my brain function. In particular, we're getting close to exam time. So I think it's really important to moderate your intake and maybe think about adopting some healthier behaviours opposed to, say, drinking, smoking or any other sort of unhealthy behaviours. So what you can be doing is when you are studying, maybe perhaps have like a nut or seeds trail mix to help ensure, you know, that you're having um, a wide variety of fruits and vegetables in your diet but it also can help take you away from those unhealthy behaviors and substitute it with something a little bit better so is that something that's like widely available at retail stores or something i mean i'm i'm not a nutritional person Mm. in the slightest i'm horrible so like someone like me if i wanted to do that which i probably won't but for sake yep. of the argument, where would I where would I get a trail mix? Mm-hmm. So what you can be doing is getting the small thirty gram um, boxes. They kind of look like little matchsticks, if you like. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you can be making your own and just putting in your own, you know, nuts and seeds, and that can be um, much more economical and um, help you save a bit more money as well. Okay, so it's like a mm. s- smoothie sort of. Um, so what it is, it's like a little trail mix that you would just snack on, kind of like, you know, how when people go hiking, they might okay. take nuts and seeds and fruit. Um, but you could be topping them on your smoothies if you wanted as well to just bump up your intake a little bit there. I see. Is I anyone see. on campus that sells this, like nut mix or? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, sometimes they sell them with yogurts as well. Yogurt is really high in calcium and protein. So that can really help you keep you going throughout the day. So it's a good nutritious breakfast or a small snack as well. Hmm. And with smoking, like it mm-hmm. reduces our appetite. They say when you quit smoking, people tend to eat more. What, like, why is that? Like, why do people like substitute quitting smoking and eat more? And yeah, so I think it's about substituting a behaviour. Um, like the to, habit. Yeah, it's about a habitual kind of behaviour. And um, with smoking, we know that it can increase vitamin C requirements. So on last week's show, we were talking about the immune system and how vitamin C is really important throughout winter because it can act as an antioxidant. So it can really be quite helpful when we are trying to avoid the winter cold. Interesting. I did not know that smoking deprived you of vitamin C. Just drink some orange juice and balance yourself out, I suppose. Yeah, so if you are, you know, having a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, it can really help ensure that your vitamin C intake is adequate. But, you know, if you are having, like, lots of cigarettes and even alcohol, it can displace a lot of your nutrients because you are, you know, consuming other things over healthier options. So are there any other habits that you'd suggest to, um, you know, take up instead of 
drinking excessively or smoking. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, planning out your week, what you are going to be eating. If you are, you know, going to be having some drinks, maybe set yourself a limit and sticking to that limit. If you are, you know, wanting to have alcohol, maybe consider moderating your intake. If you're thinking of having a spirit, maybe reduce it to 15 mils, so half a shot instead of the full shot. Um, It's interesting to know, you know, how quickly your kilojoule content can add up just by drinking. So if you were to have four full strength beers that would equate to nearly half of your energy intake if you're a male so be careful with moderating your intake can really help you know and I think if you are feeling like peer pressured by your peers and things like that coming up with some phrases things like you know I'm taking medication at the moment and alcohol interferes with it or I'm the designated driver just simple phrases like that can really help avoid you know drinking excessively yeah it sucks that we have to come up with ways to you know, yeah definitely make excuses for us to not drink when we go out and stay away from processed food, like meats as well like when you're studying because that probably well, destroys your mentality like your focus and crash easier even like energy drinks we yeah. want to stay away from as well yeah so i think what you want to be ensuring is that you have a mixture of low gi and high gi foods so the low gi foods they're what release carbohydrates quite slowly throughout the body but the high gi ones they give you the quick energy release that you need in terms of processed meats which you were saying before you probably want to be choosing the leaner cuts of meats so ones without a lot of fat in them um and we do know that there's some research suggesting that processed meats they have quite a lot of salt in them and they're not good for say cancers and things like that so cut down the, the hsps as they call it over here yes yes <laughs> do they not call it hsps over in uh, let's call it donna meat and chips back home fair enough fair enough yeah awesome and you have a uh, a stall Yes. So today at La Trobe University, we have a um, food stall. So my class, we've been making lots of different products. So um, I'm doing a pizza. It's called Plant Pizza. It's quite rich in um, fibre and protein. It's a vegan pizza. Um, It's got a sort of Mexican theme to it. So it's got a spicy hit to it as well. So yeah, you guys should all come down and check it out. It's in um, Parabolus West between two and four. Awesome. Awesome. We'll we'll definitely have a look at that. Thank you very much for coming on the show again, Finn. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Finn. So, Parabolus West from 2 o'clock, I believe. Yeah, awesome. So, what did you have for breakfast this morning? I had porridge with almond milk with a little bit of jam. How about yourself? Yeah, I had a meat pie. That's very Pe- Aussie pepper, you. Pepper and steak. Yeah, that is very Aussie of you. It's ironic. I'm, I'm Greek, <laughs> actually. <laughs> There's no food at home, so that's, that's what I had. I, I don't, do, do you have that every morning? Yeah, I do. I try to cut toast out my diet. Damn, that's um, impressive. Just drink water throughout the day. I'm getting, getting older. I need to look after myself. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. All right, well, um, I believe we have our next guest, who is a uh, regular on the show and part of our beloved Upstart team, Jess Whitby, who will be talking to us about housing affordability. Hello, Hi, Jess. Hi, Jess. Hi. How are you going? I'm good. Yourself? I'm fabulous-ish. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we're going to have a chat about housing affordability, so... Um, last week, the Rental Affordability Index uh, was released by a consultancy, SGS Economics and Planning, and it's a data set that compares median rent across suburbs in Australia and pops them up against um, the median income of certain households, so student share houses, single parents, uh, double-income families with kids... Um, And it basically showed that rent affordability has decreased in all metro areas except for Perth, which is basically say that rent's become unaffordable and even more unaffordable in the last six months. Um, And it's really interesting. I mean, say release is twice yearly since 2015. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting to see just how this has grown and how the problem is seemingly only getting worse. I mean, this is hard facts to prove that, uh, that... housing is really becoming more expensive and rent is becoming more expensive. Um, So on the map you can see that... um, (laughs) Sorry. Um, Affordable housing, pretty much spending 30% or less of your income on rent. So if you're spending more than 30%, this is what this agency is classed as unaffordable housing. Um, And that's past their affordable housing threshold. So the map we're about to see, if an area is red, it means that you're spending 60% or more of your income on rent. That's just an astounding mm. amount of money that is just going towards paying for a, ha- a roof over your head. Like, ridiculous. So looking at the map that should be up on the screens, 
Um, this is a perspective from the student share house. So it shows that there's three Melbourne suburbs. The class is extremely unaffordable. So Albert Park, Docklands and East Melbourne. I mean, like these are all pretty affluent areas, lots mm. of high rises. Albert Park is very, very expensive. <laughs> Um, but what's more interesting is we can see that even in our southeast suburbs, so all the way down the the Bay Coast, so Brighton, Brighton. St Kilda, Elwood, all the way around to Brunswick, even Footscray, all classes severely unaffordable. And even then your outer suburbs, Burwood, they're still moderately unaffordable, which still means you're spending between 30, 30 and 60% of your rent, your income on rent, which is pretty hard so as a student this data really shows us that to find affordable housing and to spend an affordable amount of your income on rent you're really having to venture really far out of the city to like the ends of train lines so Cranbourne, Hoppers Crossing, Craigieburn and for a lot of students that's just not really that possible it's not that practical living in Hoppers Crossing and attending uni in Bandura or living in Craigieburn and going to Monash Clayton like it's really quite difficult. Yes, yeah. it is. Yes, it is. So what would be the, the most um, affordable areas then? Yes, yeah, so those most affordable areas are the, really the areas that we're seeing classed on this map as affordable, which is you're spending less than 30% or less of your income on rent. In the outer suburbs. Yeah, in the outer suburbs. So Cranbourne, Hoppers Crossing, Craigieburn, even Melton. Um, Melton. Those areas are really, that's what this data is showing us is affordable for a student these days to rent. Um yeah, and I think this data is really interesting because I feel like it's a really nice hard set of information that shows us that we're not just wh- wh- whinging millennials that go, oh, I spent all my money on brunch and smashed over this week and I can't afford to pay rent. It's There is a serious problem and this problem is only getting worse. We see when you compare this data set to two quarters ago or a year ago, the areas of red and yellow and orange on the map, which indicates the unaffordability, are only getting bigger. It's only getting more difficult. Um, and I guess this is probably why we're seeing a lot of reports that students are choosing to stay at home longer. I mean, the ABS recently told us around half of 18 to 24-year-olds are still at home. And we're also seeing record um, lows in wages at the moment and wage increases and so it's really compounding the problem. I mean, we're getting paid, we're not getting paid as much as we should be and we're in a more expensive rental market. There's no wonder that more students are at home still. Um, and even when you consider things like on-campus housing, I mean, it's not that affordable. It's definitely no more affordable than living in um, mm. renting, I guess. It kind of feels like dead money in a way. Like Which like, does. Like renting, like, cause you're not really saving anything. You're spending it on rent and then just to get by and then it just yeah, kind of feels like dead Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you like... If you live at home, you can save up and potentially save up for a deposit for a house instead of just spending loads of money on rent and not be able to afford a house. Yeah, that's true. I also feel like there's a bit of a double-edged sword to this problem because it's like a lot of students, people complain that, oh, students are living at home, they mooch you off their parents, you should be paying board, you're 22 years old. But it's also like the other problem of... Well, there's the other end of the stick where not a lot of students actually have the luxury to stay at home. I mean, we were talking to our sports expert, Ryan, earlier today, and he was telling us about how he sa- he was from Tasmania and he had to save it for a year to be able to move to Melbourne and fi- afford to pay rent here. And even still, he's now in his third year and he had to give up a day of paid work to intern for a part mm-hmm. of his course. And he still finds it pretty unaffordable. And it really compounds the situation for him. And it's really rough to try and, I guess, for a lot of students who experience that, we're expected to undertake placements or internships and volunteer and all these things to try and secure these good-paying jobs at the end of our degrees so we can have a house. And still, it's just not possible. I mean, if you can't stay at home, you have to move out of home to attend Mm. university. Centrelink, rent assistance, are only going to get you so far. I mean, it's quite a precarious situation I think but also quite a difficult one and I think more needs to be done for state government federal government local even universities to really support students I mean I believe it was only this year that Latrobe introduced a two thousand dollar grant for students doing a placement which is such a big help when you're living at home and you're paying Mm. rent and you have to give up paid work like Ryan did to be able to complete your degree Mm. Well, at least now there's, uh, there's a lot of stable evidence. 
yeah. chilling, as you were saying, instead of, you know, just millennials kind of complaining about it and all these yeah. non millennials telling us that we should stop buying smashed abo. Mm. I don't yeah. even like Avo. <laughs> Didn't that millionaire quote, he, quote saying that if you stop buying avocado on toast, you'll be able to afford a house? He did. I'm pretty sure he also got a small loan of a uh, thirty-five and a half <laughs> thousand or something like that when he was in uni. Yeah, and possibly something a free like education. That. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was... It was yeah. yeah, it's... Yeah, I think that's definitely something that the perks of such a solid data set like this, it's being consistently produced and is showing median rent versus median income for certain brackets. I think that's really one of the perks is that there's this solid data to show that, no, millennials aren't just wasting their money and aren't just living beyond their means. They actually can't afford to live in Mm. rent or they can't afford to move out of home and it's a real problem, I guess. So do you think this might bring more attention to the, uh, the whole situation? this data set being I certainly hope so. I mean, community sector banking chief executive Andrew Cairns told BuzzFeed that he really hopes that this data set uh, should be a wake-up call, and he said it needs to be a wake-up call for coordinated action on housing affordability because, I mean, when we're reading the paper even, you see more and more reports of housing bubble, it's not going to pop, it's just getting bigger and bigger, and I think hopefully uh, this data can really do something and create some kind of motion to to make something happen. Yeah. I personally find it more affordable over here compared to when I was living in London. I couldn't actually move out of my house. It was, um, I think, to find a place in London, it was twelve to fourteen hundred dollars a month get paid monthly my wage was eleven dollars an hour and my train from my house to london was five hundred and twenty five dollars per month jesus wow so how, just, how long have you been here for two and a half years i find it a lot more easier to manage my money i get paid weekly the money's better but just london it, it's kind of like you're kind of following the same direction we're going and it's just slowly catching up with, with us mm. yeah that sounds pretty bad actually mm. yeah yeah, I think it's definitely tricky. I think it's one of those things that, like, maybe you get lucky, you find a good house or you're fortunate and you have a good-paying job, but I think for the majority of students it's quite difficult to rent in mm. Australia and I think this really shows that. Um, what I think would be really great with this data set, I think something that would be really interesting to compare it to is how many students are actually living in those areas that are being classed as unaffordable or severely unaffordable or extremely unaffordable and what that looks like and where these groups are actually living. I think that could really be interesting and really show us are these uh, students being forced to live in houses that they can't afford to because if they live anywhere else, it's going to cost them more money. Like living in Hopper's Crossing and commuting might cost you more in terms of having to pay for rent and petrol and transport. Yeah, even your time's worth more as well. So yeah. An it's just not commute, practical. Got to go into, the, go into the city via the city loop, then go back out because the infrastructure, it just can't manage it. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I really hope this data set can kind of create some motion and really make something happen in the community to help support not just students, but, I mean, even you could see single parents with income um, the map was pretty hard for them. It was lots of severely unaffordable and moderately unaffordable. And I think it'd be really interesting to see, hopefully, what it does and if it can yeah. create some movement. No, hopefully it, it starts something. Thank mm. you very much for that, Jess. No Thanks, worries. Jess. Thanks, guys, for having me. That's some pretty stressful stuff, isn't it, James? Pretty stressful. Thank God we had stress-free week last week. We did. We did. That what a, a segue that was. Beautiful. We actually have a package for that. Let's, uh, let's, let's check it out. Hello everyone and welcome to Stress Less Week. It's La Trobe's very own Stress Less Week and we're here today in the most important time of the semester to make sure that you're feeling calm before the storm, which I mean by exams. Exams will kill you and assignments will too. So what better way than relax, enjoy yourself and have fun. Like today we've got some fun events that has been put together by the student union. We have face painting, we have the animal zoo, the farm, um, different stores from different couple societies and the different departments of the LTSU. So yeah, it's a really fun day, it's really awesome. Here's a free food, the music's pretty good, so let's enjoy.
What a spectacle that was. You you were there, James. Yeah, I was, saw you. Yeah, it was, was you. It was a lot of fun, actually. They had um, inflatable balls where you could put them on a suit and, like, run into people, take them out. Well, try, <laughs> try and score a goal, but you can kind of, like, really take out a bit of anger, maybe, you know? Yeah, that's not a bad idea, actually. A bit of stress release through violence. Yeah, then... Uh, but safe violence. Then it was an animal petting area with, like, they had rabbits, they had a dog, a goat. I think it was a micro pig there. I'm not even too sure. Micro Various pig. ducks, yeah. It's impressive. And everyone was just loving it. And it was like free pancakes or crepes, if you'd like to call it. There was um, a DJ. A DJ? Yeah. Nice. Was he good? I thought it was okay. He didn't have the, the biggest crowd around him, but... Shocker. Uh, yeah, typical. And then where else was there? I'm trying to think. What, to think of the back of my I mind. saw the... Uh, free the, snacks uh, uh, as well. Oh, free snacks. Free snacks. Got to get around the free snacks. Were they Bunnings? Have you had Bunnings snacks yet? I haven't. James. James Hurley. Hey, I've got, I've got a little confession. I don't really like the snacks over here. No. If you think James, if you guys want to donate to James having a bunning snag, please tweet us at eleventh hour underscore ltu. We'll set up a GoFundMe account for James. Mm. I also saw they had a uh, one of those tennis things on a pogo stick. Yeah, like um, people giving it a go, but after about two or three swings, you. Depending on who was you're playing against, people were just whacking it and kind of giving up because it was just going straight past their face. Yeah, I think I saw Braden and their uh, ex ex host Scal Maloney have yeah. a go at that. Braden, of course, sports guru, just smashing it. Thought, thought he was Roger Federer out there, didn't he? Sorry, thought he was like Roger Federer out there, I was uh, just pinging it about. Yeah, tennis things. I don't watch tennis. Really? No. Did you know it's my favourite sport? It's not surprising though, because you, you are British. British and Wimbledon. Wimbledon, yeah. Strawberries and cream, tea, hymns. <laughs> All the stereotypes. It's going to picnic on the bench, yeah. Nice, nice. Well, you might remember a couple of weeks ago we had Kristen Sedinelli with her life hacks. This week she's back again with more life hacks to entertain you and help you, hopefully. Let's take a look. guys you want to get fit like me you want to have everything at your feet well follow these easy steps and one two three four hut two bend and snap one two and bend. this is crap i don't want to lose weight i just want to be a god i just want to embrace myself and, and live my life to the fullest extent wait a minute why don't I teach myself? <laughs> mm. Welcome back to another episode of Kristen's Life Hacks. Today, I'm going to teach you how to be a god. And that means, well, just embracing yourself and being confident. And a whole lot of other steps. But let's get through it all. Step 1. Be confident. Shake what your mama gave you. Step 2. Dress the way you want to dress, no matter what anyone says. Step 3. Be courageous, even when things don't work out the way you want them to. Step 4. Choose the path of life you want to stroll down, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And most importantly, just be yourself. You can be a god in your own eyes if you love yourself and just treat people the way that you want to be treated. It's the most important thing. Bye bye for now. See you next time. Well, was this a life hack or was this just, you know, learning more life lessons? Anyway, see you later. Thank you for that, Kristen, for another wonderful segment of Life Hacks. Now, back to Lisa Berg for the news headline recap. Lisa? Thank you. Um, an update on the Manchester attack. 19 are confirmed dead and over 50 injured after the explosion. 
Security Minister Ben Wallace has called for vigilance, saying, in the light of the attack in Manchester tonight, please be vigilant, and if you see anything suspicious, call the anti-terrorist hotline. Prime Minister Theresa May has said, we are working to establish the full details of what is being treated by the police as an appalling terrorist attack. All our thoughts are with the victims and the family of those who have been affected. Andrew Twiggy Forrest has donated $400 million to various Australian charities. A South African big game hunter has been killed during a hunt by a large female elephant. And police are investigating a potential signal fault after the tram collision in Melbourne's inner north on Monday. Those are all the updates I have for you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, guys. And now we will have a man who is very close to all of our hearts. He's a father figure for many of us. His name, Phil Kafkaloudis, and we'll be interviewing him in a very exclusive show, even though he's been on pretty much all the other Upstart shows until now. <laughs> Phil, how are you going today? What's this father figure stuff? You say I'm old enough to be your father. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Fair enough. Roll laughs> Thanks very much. Guys, Have lovely to be here. Nice show. You do it really you. well. Thank I was, you. I was talking to James. Yeah. <laughs> of course you were. Oh, of course you were. Always hating on the Greek kid. <laughs> so, Phil, yep. how long have you been in the industry? Which industry? The media industry. The media, oh, 30-something years I've been doing it. Yeah. I know. I started in commercial radio and then I moved over to the ABC and did radio, did television, worked in a dozen countries. I was a political reporter for ABC TV in Sydney and then nine years hosting our breakfast show on Radio Australia, which is the Australian version of BBC World. So I have had a lot of of really great opportunities in the media and it's a fabulous industry. I've interviewed everyone I've ever wanted to interview, except Keith Richards. <laughs> well, thankfully Keith he's Richards. not dead yet. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know. Still but the opportunity. I, well, I saw him on stage. He looked like he died, but, you know, he... Was that gen- in the 90s? <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, yeah, so that's right. He sort of does have this sort of decomposing look about him, but I'd love to interview him, but it's probably never going to happen. But we'll see. I've interviewed everyone else I like. Yeah. Very, very nice. Who was your uh, favourite you interviewed? Who was your favourite person you interviewed? Like I, you know, people, it's like the guy from Kiss, Paul Stanley, not the guy with the tongue, yeah. the other one. Um, Gene Simmons, that one? Yeah, Eric Idle from Monty Python was very funny. He was great. Doc from Back to the Future. We were talking about this before the show. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was such a gentle, beautiful guy to interview. John Lord from Deep Purple, I loved. You know, there's, there's, John Lord. But you know what? I remember the interview I really loved doing was with a guy called Derek Jacobi, who you've probably never heard of. He's a um, British actor. He was in, he's been in a lot of great films. Just because never I'm British, I don't know everything. <laughs> you don't know Derek Jacobi? <laughs> no, I don't. No, Derek. He once, I remember sitting in a studio with him and asked him about confidence. Did he ever lose confidence before he went on stage? And he looked at me and he started crying. This guy is about 72 at the time. He started crying. He said, yeah, I was about to go on stage um, to do Hamlet's soliloquy. And he said, I asked myself the question no actor must ever ask themselves. And he's crying as he's saying this. And that question was, am I worthy of Shakespeare? And it was, I started crying, you know, it's a whole empathetic thing. He started crying, I was crying. He said, I couldn't go on stage for six months. I lost confidence. I got stage oh. fright. This is after having been in the industry for 40 years. I'd lost all confidence. Mm. So that was one of those moments. And in any in interview, when you actually do get underneath all the gloss, you know, interviewed Roger Moore, you can't get anywhere with Roger Moore. He's just full of stories and you're not getting anywhere near the real person. With this guy, I got to the real person. And that interview has stayed with me for years. That was about 15 years ago. Was that a live interview? Or yeah, live. live. No, no, actually, no, it was a pre-recorded interview. For? But for news radio on the ABC, yeah. So I ran the whole thing. It went for about an hour and I ran the whole thing and um, it was great to do that. But that one stayed with me. There have been other interviews, but that one stayed with me more than any. So you've reported in uh, multiple countries, said mm. about a dozen or so. Mm. Well, yeah. what's, what's been your most memorable um, TV moment? From overseas, overseas, yeah. I remember it was probably the most recent one when I was in Istanbul and we were caught up. I actually wasn't there to report to do any work, I was just on holiday and it was two years ago. And I 
we got caught up in a big riot because there's tension between Syria and Turkey mm. at the moment about getting the refugees. You've got half of Turkey saying that, you know, we shouldn't have these refugees coming to Turkey. And we've got half of Turkey saying we should let more in. So you've got this real push like you have in Australia about refugees. And so there was a demonstration in favour of having more refugees come and that's against the government, what the government wanted. And so there was tear gas and a, a, a protester was killed. And so there I was in the middle of it all, tear gas. You've ever been tear gassed? You know, it's not I something have. you ever... You have, yeah. yeah. It's an awful thing. Went to thing. a football game in Paris, Chelsea versus oh, PSG, and they just tear gas you for the fun of it. <laughs> Yeah, like well, the security or, or the police, the, the police, and they actually go. need to do it because in soccer games nothing happens for ninety percent of the game. So you know you need some, you need something to enliven it. You know clearly it's all those hooligans. Yeah, well, it's, it's, yeah. The French priests love the English hooligans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys rock up in like a, a van? No, no, no. Well, okay. they, they do take you off the train and they guide you like to the. Um, to the stadium. stadium. Uh, I think two years ago they guided a few Chelsea fans to stay when they took them round the corner and if they got jumped by PSG fans where they were saying the police might have been in on it. But it's just, oh, that's so unusual. It, it's, the, <laughs> it, 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 the atmosphere of football games in Europe is really odd. Like sometimes the, it comes across the police turn a blind eye to like, I know um, when English fans kind of get abused. Sometimes we are asking for it, but... Yeah, some... Sometimes we are asking for it. Uh, like, do you mean like you know, when you <laughs> beat up it. other people and, and then is that... That's what they kind of like indicate, yeah. Oh, yeah, like, okay. I, I'm surprised Because they've been that, drinking yeah. and it's yeah. just like, oh, it's yeah. chaos. Cool. Green Street hooligan style. Nah, not Green Street. That's a bit too Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, anyway, back to me. I, um, <laughs> wow. I, I, was, caught, I was caught in this. Istanbul, yes. Yeah. Istanbul. And it was a funny thing because, as I say, I was on holiday and, as Joe knows, you're going to probably go through this as well. I was thinking my first thought was I've got to get the hell out of here because, you know, there's a, a, a running stampede of people. I think we're going to find that what happened in Manchester this morning, mm. and um, as Lisa was just telling you, about 19 people dead after uh, some explosions at a stadium in Manchester. The big danger is people running to get away from it. That is the big danger. There's the initial thing that happens and there's people get out, people die. We've seen that in football games many times. Um, so I was thinking as this crowd was ch charging towards me, got to get out of here. And it was only as I was leaving that I realised this is a big story here. Something really big is going down. So I got all the info I needed and reported for ABC News Breakfast and Radio New Zealand and um, Red Simons, who's one of our presenters in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I did all that, but, you know, it's something that almost didn't happen. I could have just gone back to the hotel and gone to sleep, mm. but I didn't. I actually did that. But that's how reporters' lives hit them, especially when you're away, you know, whenever you're anywhere. There are stories everywhere, you know, and we miss them. We just don't look at them. We see them. I remember last year there were some elections, remember, um, here at the university and there was some untoward behaviour and you came in, Adam, and said, look, have you got a, you know, can we put this live to where, what was happening? And Story everywhere, it. just got to look for it. You just do. And be open to it. You see it. It's there. Stories everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So, Phil, how long have you been teaching at La Trobe for? Three years. Three years. Yeah. It's not nearly as long as I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> but 42 Phil... years I've been teaching here at La Trobe, my friends, and uh, yeah, yeah, no, three years ago I started this place, yeah, starting in journalism, and I remember you were a fresh-faced little I was in first, first year, year, second semester, <laughs> the interview, you came into my life. Yes, and I remember you were nervous doing the interview. You always no, came. No, I remember no, that. I'm never <laughs> My name's Adam. I don't get nervous. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yes. Cool customer. Yeah, yeah, you are. Yes. Always, always. You didn't have a beard then, did you? Yeah, I did. Did you? I've had a beard since you were 12. I started. Yeah, yeah. It's a great Before thing. you could walk. Yeah. <laughs> the beard actually came out first. <laughs> <laughs> I followed. Um, well, mm. for those of you who don't know, this is actually Phil's final semester, and this being the final week of semester one, it's Phil's also final week. Mm. So we've made a montage for Phil, which we're going to play in a few minutes. Thank you very much, Phil. It's Thank been a pleasure you, having you've, you. You've made a, a montage. We've made a montage of, of you, Phil. I just hope you know that I haven't marked you guys yet. Mm. We're, we are willing to take that risk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We put our hearts and souls into this. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Phil. Pleasure. Cool. All right. Let's roll the montage. Who 
It came to us through the interview Then it taught that one podcast and subject to Interview A film Interboard You forgot MME He was the brightest star in a dark department The best <laughs> teacher you'll ever have in your sad, sad life I called him father no, you didn't. Oh, I feel, feel, I feel, why'd you leave so soon? Too f- soon, yeah. Feel, I feel, why'd you leave so soon? Emotional music. Oh, you came, you ran up Star Live, but now you're leaving us here, and we're so confused. Where am I? Why'd you leave so soon? Yeah, yeah, he was cool. I had him for like one subject. Saw him around the Eagle Bar a lot. Like, talked to him maybe once. What what a moving, what a, what a moving uh, video. It's brought me to tears. It's gonna be sad to see him go. Um, on a lighter note, actually not a lighter note, because uh, we'll ha- we have our cameraman Michael Bizzardo reviewing the movie The Crow, which is a, a cult classic. Have you seen it? Jay? I haven't. No. Have you? Neither have I. So it's gonna be. Uh, I I know what it's about, but I just never gone around to see it. So uh, okay, twenty three years ago, I believe. Something like that. It was definitely a mid nineties, so it'll be interesting 94. to see uh, see what he has to say about that. Let's uh, let's roll that. So my movie of the week is the nineteen ninety four film The Crow, based on the old folklore that when you die, a crow comes and takes your soul to the afterlife. But sometimes, in rare cases when the soul cannot rest, it gets brought back to the land of the living. Director Alex Proyas decides to tell this folklore through the story of Eric and Shelley, a soon-to-be-married couple who were murdered the night before their wedding by a group of ruthless thugs. Oh, and did I mention they were murdered on top of a bell tower? And it happened the night before Halloween. Yeah, they went all out with the horror tropes for this one. However, a year later, Eric is brought back to life with the help of a crow and makes it his mission to kill all the aforementioned thugs to avenge his beloved Shelley. So the film has this premise that Eric can feel no pain unless his crow sidekick dies, meaning that the film turns into this badass vigilante hitman meets Terminator action flick. Watching Eric and his crow take out these thugs one by one in the most gruesome ways possible is the real highlight of this film. Besides its fantastic main cast of characters, the other thing that I really like about this film is the whole look and style and aesthetic that it's going for, which it really nails. The city is dark and scary and brooding and gothic and it looks like it's filled with danger and I got some real Arkham City vibes from the place. I'm willing to put aside my personal feelings for those demonic creatures that are crows for the greater good of film. I had a really good time with this movie and I suggest you take the time out this Halloween to watch it as well. Or watch it now. It's that good. This has been Michael Pizzato reporting for the eleventh hour. Get around to that movie, James. What yeah, do you reckon? Definitely. Yeah. That's I'll have to check if it's on Netflix. I wonder if it's on Netflix. Gotta love or Netflix. Stan? Stan? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Well, now we're on to sports with our two gurus, Braden May and Ryan Rosendale. What's uh, what's happening in the world of sports, fellas? G'day guys. Yeah, yeah. how you going guys? Big week in sports, uh, but yeah, nice to have you on the panel with us, Adam. That that's okay. 
Thanks for being here, mate. I, but I will be offering nothing to this sports conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We'll uh, we'll take the lead. But Braden, you're going to run us through the uh, weekend results. Big weekend of in the AFL yet again. Geelong back to form on Friday night with a big victory over the Dogs before S- Sydney continue their strong form and smacks in Kilda. Yeah, they are. Uh, they towed the Saints up, and they've won three on the trot after starting zero six. But uh, we're going to focus on that first game you mentioned, the uh, Geelong and Western Bulldogs from Friday night down at Skilled. Uh, for me, it was game of the year with uh, equal game of the year with GWS and the Dogs from a few weeks ago. Big call, but I think that was performance of the year in the first half. And Patrick Dangerfield, unbelievable, three goals, twenty. 23- Three goals and 23 disposals, sorry. And he just, unbelievable. That goal on his left foot from the boundary just summed him up as a Yeah, player. that first goal he kicked was a brilliant one. And I think he was the first guy since um, Champion Data has taken stats that's kicked four goals, had 36 touches and 12 tackles. I think he's the first guy ever to have double figures in disposals and tackles and multiple goals since forever, I guess. And it was a record for Geelong as well. Their tackling pressure, they were targeted during the week. They were just smashed. Every contest... Three or four blokes harassing harassing the Bulldogs, who panic stations almost. Back-to-back losses, sitting eighth on the ladder. The question's got to be asked, was last year's premiership one on emotion? Um, I think... I think everyone knows that they weren't. I don't think they were the best team the whole of last year. They were really good for the whole of the year. They were re- really, really consistent. But they just had that really good four week patch in the finals that got them over the line. But I think Cloak, Travis Cloak, the new recruit, his 50 metre penalty at the start of that last quarter against Joel Selwood when it was tight and I think it was 68 to 61. I think that was a massive shift in the game. In the game. Um, in the game. Yeah, and Luke Beveridge after the game did. Not like it at all in the post-match presser. He, honest, he called Travis Cloak out as one of his experienced leaders, as a new bloke to the club in, what, round nine. He's only played four or five games now, obviously with that rib injury. He's got to make up for it this week. Yeah, he's, he's got a big job this week because I think Cramery's coming back from injury. I think, um, you know, they've got four key tall forwards. They've got Red, Jack Redpass coming off an ACL. You've got Travis Cloak. You've got Tom Boyd, the million-dollar man. And you've got... Um, Cramery coming back from injury. So I don't think you can play all four of those guys and Jake Stringer in a forward line. I think it's not viable to play four tools, especially when they're not all in form. Like, you can't play enough enough tall forwards without having enough crumbs at their feet. And I think I've got to agree with that. Jack Redpath's made a seamless transition back from his ACL injury. He's just looked the goods, and I think he's going to be the main man. But I think the big key for the dogs is Jordan Ruffhead in the ruck. Tom Boyd, there's a lot of critics. I'm a fan of him. He works hard. He's not a number one ruckman. He was drafted as a forward. When he was drafted, you saw him presented in the jumper. This bloke was a monster next to these other kids. He'll benefit in the second half of the year with Jordan Ruffin. Yeah, I think he proved in that grand final last year when he probably should have won the Norm Smith. I think he ran it, ran second. But he proved that he's got the talent. It's just a matter for Tom of consistency to back it up week after week. And I think on the weekend he was probably beaten in the ruck by Zach Smith, who played probably his best game ever in his probably five, six-year career. I think he had ten tackles. He was one of mm-hmm. four cats to have double double tackles. I think Duncan had 18. Selwood had, Scott Selwood had 17. Danger, we mentioned, had 12, and Zach Smith had 10. So I think he was beaten pretty, pretty well on, on Friday night, but it's a matter of consistency for Tom Boyd. Exactly right. But now we're going to move on to our hot topic, and I know Ryan and myself are pretty heavy on this, and it's the MRP under scrutiny for the jumper punch, or just the way they're handling suspensions at the moment. Yeah, so it was a pretty hot weekend. We had uh, on Saturday night the Collingwood and Hawthorne game, which is an outstanding game to watch, but um, Hawks skipper Luke Hodge just caught, um, I think Taylor Adams get, might have, um, given him one, he, he gave one back to Adams, and then Penelbury came over, and he kind of gave one to Hodge. But I think things got a bit more heated again at the G on Sunday when it was North Melbourne and Melbourne. I think um, Sean Higgins was probably he's probably the Kangaroos' best player at the minute. I think he was targeted by a few of the a few of the Demons players, and in that second quarter, that's probably the most uh, the most jumper punches and tummy taps I've seen in a game ever. It was a long a long time in the making that stuff. But Sean Higgins, what I liked about it, I'm not calling on for the jumper punches to occur and these tummy taps as you stated but I love the way that Melbourne went after Sean Higgins is their best player and it put him off his game uh, yeah I think there's a way to go after someone I don't, I don't think the way I think they enticed Higgins enough that it got under his skin and you could see I could think he gave Viney one before the before the game started and then that one he gave to um, Clayton Oliver who's in outstanding form and I think he's a real smoky for the Brownlow but they got, he gave Oliver one, and that's what really I think got everyone up and going. I think, and then you saw Bernie Vince 
tried to nearly take um, Ben Cunnington's head off with that tackle, which mm. was I don't know how how oh, I think it was a free kick, but I don't it know how. Yeah, kick. it was a free kick, but I'm not sure how Cunnington who retaliated with that with that tummy tap. I know it doesn't look as bad as you know your sling tackles or your your head high hits, but it forced Bernie Vince off the ground, and I wouldn't say Bernie Vince is he was dry reach. Yeah, like, he was. Doesn't on, that yeah. sum up and to I, you? If, yeah. If I was to punch you right now and you were to dry reach, what do you think people would think? Yeah, I think it'd be uh, you'd be probably under for assault, which is kind of the MRPs. You know, mm. if you do that on a footy field, that's the MRP. So I think they all copped a fine. I think everyone's accepted their fines this morning. Yeah. But I I think I, I was watching Brad Scott's press conference actually after the game and he said it's more of an umpire issue, that if umpires aren't going to pay free kicks because I think the only one that got paid in that game was um, – Sean Higgins gave Bernie Vince one maybe five minutes after that altercation with Cunnington and he got a, a free kick because he was a retaliator. But I think when Cunnington gave that one to Vince, I was amazed that the umpire didn't reverse that decision. I think one of the things pointed out with the people I was watching with, the umpire was actually on an angle behind Bernie Vince. He may not, he might have just think he's giving a quick backhand, not a full jab to the stomach that did leave him gasping for air on the bench. Yeah, but yeah. you've got some news this morning. Simon Letherlin has spoken SEN. Yeah, so Simon Letherlin, the AFL um, general manager of operations, came out this morning and he said that um, mid-season, I think, in the buy, one of the buy rounds, they're going to have a look at the uh, the MRP and there's going to be an overhaul of the, of the jumper punch um, ruling because right now I think Jimmy Bartell, who's new to the panel this year, he came out and said there's no real like grading system for... They were handcuffed, Yeah, I think they're kind was. of handcuffed because it's not... He, I think he wants something like um, non-football-related incidents and like football-related incidents. So in that case, he means when a sling, when a tackle goes wrong where it's a sling tackle or you cop someone high when it's not intentional. Whereas if you're punching someone, it's not a football act. Like it, it's... You, you're punching them. If you, gra- if you grab a bit of the jumper, it's still a punch. Like So I think... That's going to happen mid-season. But I think, as Brad Scott said, the North Melbourne coach after the game, the onus is on the umpires. If yeah. you see a, someone hit someone off the ball or on the ball or any any kind of physical hit that isn't in the laws of the game, you need to pay a free kick. And I think that's going to stamp it out long before it gets to the Monday where the MRP has to do something about but it. But I think the biggest problem, if you look at it holistically, if you, you don't have kids, obviously, but if you're a parent and you see these AFL players doing this and your kid just walks up to some kid they don't know playing on their local game on a Saturday or Sunday morning and they just whack him in the stomach. What are you going to think and how would you react? Yeah, well, on that point, I was listening to Triple M on uh, on Monday or Sunday night, I think, and there was two of the guys that were on there. I've, I've, their names have drawn a blank in the minute, but they had a, they were at um, the Oz kick on the, on the Sunday and they said that um, a few of the kids, they were at a clinic and a few of the kids said, oh, we're allowed to punch because it's they think mm. that because the AFL players do it and they get away with it, they think it's just a part of the game. You know, you can grab a bit of the jumper and you can, you know, give him one on the chin and nothing's going to happen over it. Like, when I think when it gets to that point, when kids that are going to play, uh, hopefully play AFL in the future and they're going to move up the ranks, like, if they think that it's okay to punch someone on a football field, mm. I think that's where you've got to draw a line. The AFL's got to stamp out. As they've done with sling tackles, which I think is really good. Like, they've, they've cracked so hard down on the concussion rule and I think that's great for the game. But... At the same time, you've got to tap out thing. You got to stamp out. Sorry, things like jumper punches and tummy taps because they're not. They're not a real. I know people, some people love like the biffs and everything, yeah. which is fine. But you can't just go around throwing fists on it. You know, everyone's on Alice Lynch and and um, yeah, the two thousand yeah two thousand four grand final. Like. You can't just go around throwing fists at people on a footy field. Like if you want to do that, go and step into a boxing ring. Like I know they're yeah, not big hits, perfectly. but it's still. They're still, you know, they're still, still, still punches. But I think, as a whole, the way I see it is, the AFL is a role model, and they've got to set an example for not just kids, but local leagues. Because playing, I'm sure you've played as well. We've been on the end of some hits that are not legal, but you just cop it and get along with it. But if that AFL stamps it out at the top level, that's fine. Yeah, I think that's that's back to the point of the umpires. I think the umpires are the first. That's in the heat of the game. They're the they're the first point of call. You've got to you've got to stamp it out. I think in the in the Hodge. In the Hodge situation, I think Taylor Adams gave – they were in a bit of a tussle. It was late in the last quarter. Hodge yeah. was probably a bit a bit heated. So he gave him one back, but it wasn't a really good look that Hodge kind of ran from five metres away to give him one in the in – the, I don't know if he gave him one in the back of the head, but it was more of a push and then he got him on the ground yeah, and gave him reaction. a couple. Yeah. But I think that's something we're going to have to watch closely over the coming weeks and obviously we won't be able to see it. And back to our host. Well. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah. You can always count on these guys to fill time because they're so passionate about what they do. It's, 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 nuts, it's amazing. Thanks, guys. Braden Thanks, May, guys. Ryan Rosendale, once again. Well, we've reached the end of our show. It's going to be the last show for a very long time. It's been emotional. It, it, it has been emotional. Was that a lock stock reference? It is, yes. 
Very nice. I'd like to thank Phil Cafaludis, the entire Upstart team, and my brilliant team, Michael Pizzardo, Scarlett Maloney, Zeran Altoon, Nisha, John Jang, James Hurley, Brayden May, Ryan Rosendale, Kristen Sedanali, Lisa Berg, Jess Whitby, Jess Jones, and I think that's everyone. Yeah, that, that sounds like everyone. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next semester. Thank you.